Let me start with questions that I don't think the average American can give you a good answer on. Three of them. All right. What's socialism? Mm. Now you want me to answer that. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, socialism is uh, partly an ethos, partly it's a politics. Uh, the ethos is that you belong to a social unit, not an individual self, uh, that your allegiance, your values, and in some cases your identity comes from being a part of that social unit. Uh, politically, as then, far as, as f- um, uh, does, does pure socialism go as far as anthem or uh, we? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that uh, you are born into a social unit. Uh, you are shaped by that social unit. And you're a cog. Uh, well, you can be, right, become a cog, absolutely. Okay. And your job is to perform a function in that social unit. Okay. Now, that's uh, an ethic, but then if you politicize it, then you say whatever authorities are that wield the power in that society, they can use you and direct you for social ends primarily. The individual doesn't exist or exists only to the extent that he or she is performing a social role and so can be used by the political authorities for that purpose. So... The political formulation usually is just the standard is to say the collective ownership of the means of production. But the core means of production is a human being. So that is to say the human being is owned by the collective and should be used by the collective. What is capitalism? Well, capitalism is a, a more variably defined thing. If you take capitalism as the opposite of socialism, and I think that's one legitimate usage, then you say it is uh, an individualistic ethos that I uh, make myself, I am responsible for myself, the values that I pursue in my life should be mine, and then I enter into social arrangements, family, friendships, business, Mm -hmm. sports, voluntarily, and that the purpose of the power institutions in society is to protect individuals as they pursue their, their lives. And so that would then imply the economic portion of that, which is an economic free market, and that typically is capitalism. Now, capitalism is more slippery here. Sometimes capitalism is meant only to refer to an economic system where we have private property and free Mm -hmm. exchange and so forth. Sometimes it's used more broadly to mean liberal individualism, and then that's the contrast to socialism. Between the two of them, it's easy to easier to sell socialism because we have, as um, Jonathan Haidt would say, we we all share the the care harm uh, uh, platform or pillar Mm. um, together that we want to take care of people. Capitalism kind of just leaves you out there in the cold Mm. uh, and Socialism is about making sure we all make it across the finish line together, Mm. right? Well, uh, I think socialism is a, in its political form, a perverted version of the care principle that you talk about. So care, I think we do have this. I think we do have a natural benevolence, uh, but it's not automatic. Uh, Infants, right from day one, They size up people they are interacting with. Mm -hmm. And if the person is a basically decent human being, then, of course, we form positive attachments Mm -hmm. and we want to work out mutually beneficial Mm -hmm. whatevers. On the other hand, if the infant senses that this person is not treating me appropriately at my infant level of understanding, then we start putting barriers Mm -hmm. up and the care doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, most of us as human beings want to give people initially the benefit of the doubt And so I'm open to care, open to forming relationships, but it does uh, have to be earned at at some sense. So what socialism, I think, uh, wants to do is, uh, and it can start this way. There are many routes to socialism, but it can start from I'm a a nice person and I want everybody to get across the finish line, as you you put it. And uh, I am afraid of what might happen to me if I fail in my life. And I can also then empathize with other people who are not doing well with their, with their lives. 
And so I just want the, the problems solved. And in many cases, socialism is just a, a knee jerk. I want this problem solved instantly. And the best way to solve the problem, if it's an economic problem, is to take money from people who have it and give it to the people who oh. don't have that. Now, I think that's a, a, a you know, plausible explanation for some avenues towards socialism. And it can come out of that care and, and, and a healthy Hard. benevolence. Is Canada a socialist country or a capitalist country? Mm. Uh, I, I don't think it's socialist. Uh, I, I think the way to do this is to say uh, any culture is made up of any number of subsectors. So you can say, you know, here's the economy, here's how we do family, here's how we do uh, uh, religion, here's how we do our leisure activities, here's how we do our politics. And so uh, an overall label like capitalism or socialism is going to try to capture each of those. And I think for the most part, Canada would then be an individualistic, freedom, capitalistic country. We make our own. I'm born in Canada, raised in Canada, so. I heard you uh, say out. Yes, that's so, right. Yeah. Now I'm down here in the south. <laughs> south just throw that yes. out there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's no socialism with respect to your dating life or your love life. You're perfectly free to date whomever you want. And to get married or not, right, whomever you want. So that's perfectly liberal, individualist in the in the proper sense of the word. Uh, religion is done entirely liberal, individualistically. Make your own choices, start your own church, do whatever you want. Uh, people in their artistic lives, you can consume whatever media you want. If you're a poet or a filmmaker or a writer, you can do pretty much anything that you want. So all of those things are very much free market, individualist, liberal, capitalist, and so on. Then if we just focus on the economic sector of society, there, of course, the record is a lot more mixed. And I think you would have to say Canada is a mixed economy. It has a significant number of capitalistic elements, but it also has a significant number of uh, socialistic elements as well. So The same with Sweden. The same with Sweden. And the point about both of those is that we are talking about, by most indexes, you know, so there's 190 or so countries around the world, and there are all these wonderful now in the last generation social science indexes that come out and measure this, that, or the other thing. On economic freedom, uh, uh, Canada and Sweden are all in the top 10% of nations right around the world. They got there by largely being free market capitalist oriented nations. But because they've become so rich, they can now to some extent afford some redistribution, some more uh, uh, interventionistic, and in some cases outright socialistic measures. What is the difference between that and state capitalism like China? Yeah. Well, I think state capitalism is a, is a misnomer that comes out of a corrupted intellectual mm -hmm. tradition. So if we go back and say that capitalism means... Uh, Individualistic. That's right. Then... China's out. Then China is out. So what people on the left have wanted to do because of the terrible track records of most socialist regimes is part of the saying that they weren't really socialism mm -hmm. is to then assign all of the corruptions and the things that go wrong to capitalism, whatever you mean by that. So the move that they're making, though, is to say if you put economic concerns at the top of your uh, social hierarchy, this mm -hmm. is what we are about. We are about money. We are about mm -hmm. capital. We are about economic production. Then that scale of values makes you a capitalist. If you're prizing that rather than some other social thing that you're trying to right. achieve. And then from that categorization scheme, uh, if you then say, well, individuals can do this money making, then you're a free market capitalist. If you think the government should take care of the economy and money making, then you have state capitalism. But I think that's a miscategorization from the beginning. Difference between socialism and communism. Communism is a subspecies of socialism. So it's a bit like saying uh, someone's a Christian, and then immediately you've got a six Catholic or seven, or they, Presbyterian, and, and Eastern, and, and, and so it. forth, right? So the broadest version is socialism, where you say uh, people belong to society, people should serve society, and society's uh, organizers, the politicians, should be managing all of society. Uh, communism is one particular subspecies of that. So Marx's name for it was uh, scientific socialism right, or communism, and those are mm -hmm. now what, what he means by the socialism and the particular version, or sorry, the science in the scientific socialism. That's another yeah. <laughs> avenue that we can go down. 
Uh, but he is contrasting his version of socialism with earlier, say, religious forms of socialism, where, say, we are monks and we hold all of our property communally, mm -hmm. we sleep communally, we eat communally, mm -hmm. we don't have any personal possessions. So those would be religious socialisms. Mm -hmm. And then earlier utopian socialisms from Saint-Simon and Proudhon, and, uh, and and Rousseau to some extent. Right here in Dallas. Dallas was a is the first socialist experiment in the United States. Uh, if you take away Jamestown and 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 even some of the pilgrims, but uh, I'm not familiar with that one. Oh yeah, I'll I'll have but to of look course, up the, the upper Midwest. Right. So there was a whole number of uh, socialistic experiments as well. Mm -hmm. New Harmony, Indiana, and others. So Marx and Engels were trying then in the middle part of the 1800s to distinguish their version of socialism, which they thought was more materialistic and more scientific from the other earlier versions of socialism. Any time this has ever worked? Uh, depends on what you mean by... Didn't work. end in right. death and, uh, and yeah. totalitarianism. Well, I think uh, uh, if you think that monasteries and convents are a kind of communalistic or socialistic experiment, then you could say that they can work. In a country size. Ah, okay. <laughs> right, then... Where then, you're not all volunteering to go serve God. I think... Right. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, so Jesus comes back and rules over the earth. It probably will look very socialist. Mm. You know, we'll all be putting our money in a big pot and everybody will only take what they need because mm. we'll all be honest. That is a great utopian idea. But when you actually put men in charge and you're dealing with a large society, mm. anytime it's ever worked? Well, I don't think it's a great utopian idea. Um, so I do think it's bad in theory, but your question is about whether it's worked. And no, it has never worked on any large scale. Why what, do we keep trying it? Well, that's because it has got nothing to do with economics. It's really got nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with historical understanding. Uh, the, the thought experiment I like to do, and I've done this experiment myself, is talking with socialists over the years, is no socialist ever comes to socialism by studying economics deeply. <laughs> no socialist says, I have studied the history of socialism, I've figured out what the flaws are, and I know mm -hmm. it's going to work this time. None of them have done a serious study of political governance. What it is, is morality. They think mm -hmm. it is moral. Many socialists of, uh, of my generation, I'm now a middle-aged guy, but uh, when the Soviet Union fell uh, and in the lead up to that, most socialists of, socialists of that time would say, no, it's, it's not going to work practically, but I think it's moral and I still believe it. Okay, maybe we have to make some moral compromises with capitalism and allow markets to some extent, but we're going to rely on some socialistic ethos as our... We're kind of uh, guiding principles and we're going to try to forge a middle ground. So for the practicality, yes, we'll have to you know, deal with the capitalists, but for the morals, we're going to get that from socialism. So I think it's they believe in a certain conception of justice, fairness, decency mm -hmm. that's very different from the individual liberal conception of justice, fairness, and decency. So it's a moral collision. And that's where the battle, I think, really has to be fought. All right. So I think I'm going to get there in uh, two questions. All right. First, socialism would be the exact polar opposite of we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Correct? Well, uh Yes, if you take what the founders meant by those principles, yes. Correct. What they meant was we all are born, nobody's a king over anything, nobody has a right that somebody else doesn't have. That's a political equality. Right. Yes. Right. So socialism is the exact opposite of what we have, uh, or what, what our founders were tri striving for in our mission statement in the Declaration? Yes. Well, the. Founders were individualistic, so all of the right. rights that they hold to be inalienable inhere in the individual. And from that, they're largely drawing on a Lockean tradition. So each individual, according to Locke, should be free right, in his own person, in his conscience, right, and in his, uh, in his property. So all of those are individualistic rights, but we all hold them equally. And when 
you're in a socialist society, who is the grand holder of rights, the bestower <clears throat> of rights? Yeah. Well, I think rights language ultimately has to, has to go out the window because you, know, you, you can't say you have a claim against anybody else. I mean, to, to say that you have a right is to say that you, something belongs to you, and then that puts a boundary against everyone else, including the state. So the Bill of Rights, for example, is a limitation on what states can do to the individual. So citizens. when... No, but let me finish this point. So the socialists are saying you have no rights with respect to the community. So there, are no, there are no boundaries that you can put, put against the community. So you don't have rights. Instead, you have obligations. You have responsibilities to society. So when a democratic socialist says, look, we're just looking for some common sense tampering down of rights, mm. that's dishonest. I don't know. I think if, uh, you know, I, I'm inclined to give younger people always the benefit of the doubt because sure. they don't know the history, they don't sure. know the economics and so on. But I would say if you are a college graduate and you are now intellectually mature and you are going to make public political claims, yeah. uh, if you don't know what you're talking about and you're still saying things, then there's a kind of dishonesty there. Yeah, okay. You just haven't done your homework. Okay. Right. But then uh, I think most socialists who are more articulate, you know, in their heart of hearts, they know that they, they want power. They say, yeah, it's going to be democratic, but I'm going to be the one who gets elected or I'm going to be the, the wiser person who's going to be wielding power on behalf of the community. Define freedom. Mm. Well, freedom is a, a negative. Political freedom is to say I'm not subject to a higher authority. And that then comes down to saying I have zones in which I'm free to think and which I am free to act. Now, that's to define freedom in terms of freedom, but that is to say whether I believe something, whether I say something, whether I do so is as a result of my initiative, not because of compulsion by some other authority. When you are in that state, then you are free. Now, the political freedom rests on a kind of understanding of what it is to be a moral human being, because rights are a kind of moral claim to say that politically we can't do certain things to each other. Uh, and that's to, to understand that we want human beings to be able to act a certain way, that we want people to be moral agents and that moral agency, which is pretty political, also requires a notion of freedom. Because if we're just being pushed around by forces beyond our control, we're not moral agents. So a deeper understanding of freedom comes down to a kind of volition that I have a capacity that many other species do not have to regulate my own thinking, to regulate my own behavior. And because I have that capacity, I can be held responsible for it. I'm a moral agent. And because I'm a moral agent, then that has social implications. And one of those social implications is we have to respect people as moral agents and not try to treat them like animals. So there's Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. Yes. The problem, I think, that we have now is nobody's read the first volume of Moral, moral sentiments. sentiments. Yeah. Um, and can you have freedom that lasts, can man rule himself? Can you have capitalism where the individual, where the invisible hand doesn't choke everybody to death? If you don't have a set of, I would call them Judeo-Christian values, but values that help self-governance. Mm -hmm. Can you have that? No, absolutely not. Uh, because if you think about it, a free society has to be the society that is most moral. Right. Because what you're doing is you're giving people huge amounts of freedom to say right. you can do basically whatever you want. And your assumption really is an optimistic one. The optimistic assumption is you think most people as individual can get their act together and make a go of their lives. That if you leave people free, that they can work out together without their moms and their dads or a nanny state 
telling them what to do and doing oversight. So you do have a very optimistic assumption that is built into any sort of free market capitalism or liberal individualistic society. And this is why, while socialism often has a reputation, I think, for being an optimistic utopian view, I, I do actually think it's based on very pessimistic assumptions about human beings. Socialism typically argues that there's so many people out there who are just so incompetent, they can't run their own lives and they need everybody else to chip in and look after mm -hmm. them. Right? Or if we leave people to their own devices, they're just gonna be at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. And we need then to have a big state to protect people from tearing each other apart. And all of those are very pessimistic assumptions about human beings. But then to come cycle back to your point, no, absolutely right. If you are going to give people a lot of freedom and behind that a lot of responsibility, the assumption is that they're going to be able to develop some sort of a moral code that will keep them going in the, in the proper direction. Uh, now, I'm much more of a fan of the Greco-Roman tradition than the Judeo-Christian tradition on this point here. Which is what? Uh, well, the, the, the core virtues there are, uh, in the Aristotelian tradition, a kind of prudence or a practical wisdom, that individuals are capable of exercising their minds, figuring out the world around them, understanding their own appetites, regulating their own appetites. Mm -hmm. And then thinking in terms of principles so that when you and I start interacting with each other, we can figure out what principles are going to, going to, uh, to work for us. Courage is another important one in the, in, in the tradition here. Life is challenging. There's always the risk of failure. And so developing your capacity to be willing to think about the hard problems, to be willing to, in many cases, say that you've made a mistake. That's an act of courage to change your mind to deal with other people who have different views uh, and to be willing to let them criticize your views. If we're going to have a free society, we're going to have to have lots and lots of conversations because we're going to have to work out our differences through conversation, hopefully not through violence. And so being willing to speak in public, to challenge other people, including people who have more authority, that's an act of courage and so on. So the, the virtues of you know, practical rationality, Courage, uh, temperance is another big one, being able to regulate yourself, also prized in the, the Greco-Roman tradition as well. Tell me about Ayn Rand. I know uh, I consider myself, uh, I'm kind of all over the board, um, libertarian for the most part. Um, uh, but I read Ayn Rand. I love, uh, I love her philosophy. I love her writing. For instance, Anthem is one of my favorite books, but mm. at the very end, ego. I'm like, I don't, I don't connect with that. Um, but, um, uh, she, she has this view that, you know, I don't, the charity is not necessarily a, uh, a, a, a virtue, um, and wanting to give to others unless you choose to, et cetera, et cetera. It seems very selfish. Mm. Can you, can you debunk that or? Well, sure. Well, on the, on the ego point, uh, think about you know, what, makes, what makes your life meaningful. Uh, if you let other people choose your core values for you, just from, from, from simple things, what your musical tastes are going to be, uh, what foods you like, what your clothing style is going, who your friends are going to be, what your career is going to be, whom you're going to date. None of these things, if they're going to be meaningful, can be done for you. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of shut down your ego and just let your mom dress you mm -hmm. <laughs> and your dad choose your spouse for you. I think of royalty. And, yeah, or oh, and you, and you like music just because everybody in your social crowd mm -hmm. right, likes that same kind of music, then you will not have a meaningful life. So I think one of the points that Rand is insisting is on all of the core values, including all of the social values, the things that are socially enriching, friendship, love, business acquaintances, and so forth, the precondition of those things working is that each individual involved has to see the value of it and yes. choose that value for himself or herself. Correct. Okay, so I think that's the, that's the ego point. 
Now, the second part of your question, though, is about charity. And I think, uh, according to Rand, uh, charity is a, a minor situational virtue. And certainly one of the things that's outstanding about her is she's downgrading it from being a major virtue. And in some traditions, of course, it's the primary virtue. But I think the reason for that is that Rand does have a rather optimistic view about human beings, that human beings don't need to be treated like charity cases. And if you think about it, that, that is a kind of pejorative thing. If I, I go around in the that. world saying, I'm looking for ways to, to, to find people who need my charity, Mm-hmm. That's, uh, you know, and, and, and I think for most of us who have some measure of self-respect, under what circumstances will you accept charity? Mm-hmm. It's got to be pretty desperate situations, and you've tried everything that you possibly can not to be putting yourself in a charity situation. So I think part of the assumption is that most human beings uh, can, with effort, make a go of their lives, and they don't need charity. And if you start from that assumption, then you say, what is it that's going to make it possible for people to make a go of their lives? What skills, what habits, what attitudes do we need to encourage in ourselves and in other people? Mm-hmm. That's going to be the, the, the focus of your ethics, not on how can I assume that certain people just can't solve their problems and, and fix their problems. Right. So, of course, there are going to be some people who fall between the cracks. Mm-hmm. They have bad luck. They make bad decisions. They're orphans. The, the zombie apocalypse happens or whatever. Right. right. And in those cases, absolutely. If you're dealing with a decent person who's had a run of bad luck, that person's your friend or there's some sort of a nonprofit charity out there. Sure. Charity, you're, of you're course. You're crippling people. You're crippling people when you don't allow them to fail. I mean, B- Benjamin. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Benjamin Franklin right. said the the best thing you can do is make someone uncomfortable in their poverty. Right. Um, and I don't think that is uh, uh, that's that would be. I think they might stone him to death if somebody <laughs> said a politician said that today. Yeah. Well, certainly the political ethos has yeah. uh, has shifted. No, but that point about failure is is right. You know, and failure is part of life, and you're not going to be actually living a, a meaningful life if you're not putting yourself out on the edge and, and, and accepting a certain measure of failure. So if, if from the get-go we say there's not going to be any failure, no matter what happens to you, you're always and automatically and instantly going to be bailed out, well, then you're setting people up for, for the more general failure of not putting together their own life on so their own terms. That's where we're at. We're at a place now where the world is saying, you know, too big to fail or too little to fail. Yeah. Um, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed houses. These are all the things that democratic socialists are now talking about, which I think is just corrosive to the soul. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it's kind. It's mm. so warm and fuzzy. Mm. How do you get a group of people that really haven't had to work for anything. I mean, we are the first generation. I am. I'm 54. I'm the really first generation. I haven't had to really, I didn't have to fight for something. I didn't have mm. World War II mm. where we were fighting good versus evil. The Soviet Union, I oh, didn't fight that. The mm. Politicians fought that. So I haven't had, nobody's picked me up by the jacket on political philosophy and thrown me up against the wall yeah. and said, what do you really believe? Right. We now kind of just expect it. It's always going to be this way because it always has been this way. Mm-hmm. How do you get people to value what we have before we lose it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> when everyone will go, oh, crap, that was pretty good, actually. Right. Well, that's, that's the big problem, and it's a, it's a parenting problem. It's, a, it's an education problem. I think there is great value to being in such a successful culture as we have, and we mm-hmm. have been successful in so many, and being able to take that for granted and then mm-hmm. just get on with mm-hmm. the business of you know, enjoying mm-hmm. your life and, yeah. And, and, yeah. and doing something. But it's also important to realize where that came from and what the preconditions of that are, that there is real evil out in the world, that success and progress are not automatic and that all of the goodies that we are able to enjoy don't just appear uh, magically right from heaven. And so I do think uh, there's a lot of traction to the kind of criticism that I think he was making that we do have now probably two generations of people, our generation included, who haven't had it that hard. 
mm-hmm. where we've not had to get down to the fundamentals and really think about what we are willing to die for, and then conversely, mm-hmm. what are we actually living for? Mm-hmm. So that value clarification at a very fundamental level probably hasn't hasn't happened. Can you f- be a fulfilled human being? I, I look at this as this is the luckiest time for people to live right now, I think. Mm. Um, not only because it's really good, but because it has the potential of being very, very bad as mm. well. And if it goes that way, we are going to have something that I haven't had my whole life, and that is I get to find out for sure who I am. The best or the worst of me is going to come out. Mm. Uh, and that, I'm an alcoholic. I would not be here if I hadn't had my crash and decided to get back up. Mm. Can you be a full person who you really are without that crash, without that real pain? Mm. Well, I think I'd have to say I don't know, uh, but I think we can live the best life without necessarily having alcoholism or war. Uh, force it upon us. I think all of us do recognize in most areas of our lives that if we are going to make them meaningful, we do really have to put ourselves out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, in relationships, don't work. Right? For example, if you're if you're holding back, and so we might all go through heartbreaks in our teen years and go through divorces, and those test your metal at a very deep level. Uh, and the same thing can happen in careers. If you really have some business aspirations, you start a business, you have to put yourself out there. And most entrepreneurs do go through failures several times before they achieve mm-hmm. the success. And because they have really put themselves into their business, it is a, a soul-wrenching mm-hmm. experience to go through. No different than, I think, a failed marriage or a mm-hmm. various serious relationship. I think it can also happen in religion. Right, where if you are going to make your religion or your philosophical views serious, you can't just be formulaically going through things. Mm-hmm. You have to put yourself out there. And so going through a philosophical crisis or a religious crisis is another variation. So, on it. It, so may not be, it may not be the actual bottom or crisis. It's just the risk. Well, uh, the risk always has to be there. Yeah, that's what I mean. But the, right. the crisis doesn't have to be there, but no. you have to be willing. And you have to be aware, right, that the right. risk, and if you're putting, you have to be, you know, the bankruptcy, I could get my heart broken. Right. <laughs> I could find out that I'm believing in something that doesn't exist. That has to be there. Yes. I don't think that, I think. Or artists, I think, as well, as another good yes. cultural example. Yes. If you're going to be a real artist, you got you're risk. out there. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's where, I think that's the courage that we may be missing right now Mm. is I think we as a society, we're not all that sure that we as individuals, that there's anything in there, that there's anything great in there, that there's not sure. And so many people hang on to their pain or their troubles or whatever, and that defines them. Because what, at least for me, when I started really really starting to want to learn you have to you come to a point to where you say if i take this step and this is true that means i'm going to change here here and here Mm. and you're not sure it's why people sometimes don't read things they they don't want to necessarily know that because they don't want to change exactly yeah sure right so there's a, a laziness, right, or a lack of ambition that's yeah, characteristic or, or, of, of lots of or people. Or a lack of courage sure. because you don't think that that's going to be any better or you just don't want to do that because kind of you like this over mm-hmm. here. Sure. Yeah. Tell me uh, uh, one more definition, and then I, I want to talk to you about postmodernism. Um, tell me uh, the difference between the actions of Antifa and the Nazi brown shirt. (laughs) (laughs) Great. So uh, if you just let your eyes go out of focus just Mm -hmm. a little bit and you're looking at the two groups, you don't see very much difference. You have to toe the line. 
Yes. They will beat you in the streets if you don't. Yeah. It's their way or the highway. Uh, they're against whatever the other totalitarian, you know, idea of the time. What's the difference? Yeah. yeah. So you do have a, uh, a shutdown of rationality. They've, they're past the point of saying discussion matters. Right. So they've rejected at a very fundamental any sort of liberal, democratic, republican approach to politics. And so they've bought into a view that only forceful action is going to do so. Uh, at the same time, they have people divided into groups. Right? That There are people who are in the in-group and people who are on the out-group. And anybody who is in the out-group is dehumanized from their perspective. You have to have a strongly dehumanized perspective on other people if you are willing to punch them in the face, hit them with a stick, mm -hmm. and so forth. There also is a kind of cowardice that you wear your uniform and you are losing your individuality by merging into the group. You don't go out as an individual person. You travel in a pack and everybody's wearing the same group and you're letting that group social psychology take over. Uh, and then you are deliberately putting yourself in situations where you're trying to incite violence. And there's the, it's a, the game of a street fighting chicken, who's going to hit first? Mm -hmm. And you might hit first, they might hit first, but you know somebody's going to hit first and it doesn't really matter to you. Uh, and whatever you, uh, whoever hits first, you're, you're going to just use the excuse that uh, you know, they were asking for it. That's right. So um, <clears throat> I don't see a significant difference. The only significant difference, and I think this is on a second order, is that Antifa is in its uh, intellectual origins, it's not particularly ethnic or racist. It's just a more generic approach to uh, collectivism or some sort of socialism. But of course, the brown shirts were socialists as well. So it really does come down to gang street fighting, and that's, right. that's their political model. And would you put the, I mean, nobody, everybody calls them the Nazis, but national socialists, that's mm. what they were. Um, do you put them, I think in the European right, Perhaps yes, but in America, are they on the right or the left? Mm. Left, right doesn't work. Uh, hasn't worked for a long time. So, I mean, I think it's fine to say we're to define some political spectrum and then we can say there's a left position and a right position here. But the first thing you have to do is say, what, what are you trying to measure? Are you trying to measure individualism to collectivism? Are you trying to uh, measure uh, uh, democratic procedures versus authoritarian procedures. What, what's the left and what's the right here? The way we use left and right now are just, there's this bundle of be beliefs over here, this bundle of beliefs over here. There's not necessarily any internal inconsistency in those bundles of beliefs. So it's purely uh, a journalistic right. labeling that's just slapped right. on. Right. So I think the important thing to say then is if we want to categorize the national socialists, then uh, I think they were truth in labeling. They were nationalist and they were socialist. They did take the racial slash ethnic identity of human beings to be a fundamental. They were not at all individualistic. You are born into a nationalistic group. You are born into an ethnic group. That gives you your identity. You belong to it. Your national ethnic group is in competition, if not outright conflict, with all of the other national and ethnic groups that are out there. So it's a collectivism plus a conflict. So there's zero individualism, zero understanding that you and I, if we are on different uh, ethnic groups or additional national groups, are both human beings under the skin. We have the same values that we can work things out in a win-win way. So all of that very strong nationalism, they believed it, but that's one kind of collectivism. The uh, socialism uh, from them, that meant a kind of an economic collectivism. Right? There was no, mm -hmm. we, we favor private property, we favor free trade, right? we, <laughs> we, we favor the, the free movements of people across borders, right, and so forth. All of it was very, there should be government management of the economy as a as a whole. Uh, Goebbels loved Marx. <laughs> uh, 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 and if you read through the original Nazi party program, 1920, when the party was formed, 25 points in the program, arguably 14 of them are just straight 
socialistic demands, yeah? confiscation of profiteering, uh, organization into cartels, uh, government management of this, that, and the other thing, government redistribution of wealth in this way and the other way. So uh, those 14 points, no socialist has any disagreement with any of those 14. Those were formed in 1920, all through the 1920s. They didn't change any of that. When they came to power in the 1930s, they put them into practice. So theory and practice, it's a species of socialism. Um, let's talk about postmodernism, and I want to talk to you about it mm. um, in this framework. I don't think most Americans know. I, I think if we're not there yet, we're very close, um, that we are not in the progressive era. We're in the postmodern era. Mm. Um, the progressives, they've been eaten by the postmodernists. Mm. Um, and most people get up every day and they hear a new term or a new name or a new thing that they have to do or say or call somebody. Um, and they hear how bad they were or some group was. Uh, and they don't know where this is coming from. Uh, and, and without understanding, we're, uh, we're playing into their hands, I fear. Mm. So understanding postmodernism. Yes. Yeah, postmodernism is a thing. It's an important thing. Uh, but you're also partly asking a demographics question. If we try to say, here's our era, so as we take our era to be uh, just, say, North America, mm -hmm. to keep it relatively yes. simple. Uh, then I do think you have to uh, you know, go and ask what are the main beliefs that most people believe. And I do think there are a lot of progressives out there. There are a significant number of postmoderns, and we'll come back and say what uh, what that means. But I do think... Uh, I mean, I mean yeah, it is, you're very precise with words. You're very much like Jordan Peterson. I don't know what it uh, is about you Canadians, but you're very precise. <laughs> All right. Um, Maybe it's the nerd element. <laughs> uh, so the uh, what I mean in a postmodern era, that... Um, the what's controlling the dialogue. Uh, yes, definitely. Okay. I would say that we still are largely a modernist enlightenment culture. But as we were talking earlier, a lot of that is taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And so it has a lot of cultural staying power, but it's, it's in our bones and we haven't necessarily articulated what those principles are. So what is important then is that postmodernism now for two generations is the most articulate, the most vigorous, and they to a large extent are setting the terms. So since they are loud, since there's a lot of momentum there, it is tempting then to say we're now into a postmodern era. I think what's... Again, meaning yes. just that we are all being forced to live under this rule from a very small number of people Yes, but we they're dragging us into this and we don't even know where it is or what it is. Yes. OK, that's that's fair to say. So, yeah, the most active voices and the ones who are setting the terms of the discussion mm -hmm. right, are coming from an alien philosophical and cultural framework. And that's yes. the one that we call, yes, postmodernism. Post and since it is relatively new and since it is coming from uh, 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 some intellectual and cultural sectors that a lot of people never interact with, it does take them by surprise, mm -hmm. a lot of the brazenness and the extremity mm -hmm. of, of some of those views. Now, of course, this is a, is a huge topic. Anytime you're talking about postmodernism, then you have to say something about modernism. And what the postmoderns are doing is reacting against and rejecting what they take to be the core beliefs, the core institutions of basically the last four or 500 years of call, yeah, modern history. Yeah. Or the Enlightenment as the most articulate, mature uh, expression of the, the values that have come to dominate in the modern world. Empirical data, science, yes. reason, technology, um, individualism, technology. Yes. tolerance for, for people, uh, respect for the Industrial Revolution and its achievements, a kind of universalism that all human beings should have the same rights. And so slavery is a moral abomination. The second class status of women is a moral abomination. Who, all actually, of those, how, who, who actually believes those things are bad? I, how did they get there? Mm. Well, uh, <clears throat> now we have to have arguments about kind of five or six major if, right, if this philosophical is, issues. So if they're not, if this is a, if this is, you know, a waste of time, but I just can't imagine how someone could see 
I, I understand, you know, lots of problems. But if you actually look at the world mm. and you understand history, it's getting better mm. every day for people yes. all over the world. Right. So how do you get there? Yeah. Well, I think you can get there from a, a number of routes, but let's just talk one. Suppose that we take a, a kind of political route. Suppose we say... We're going to have a kind of democratic republic. We're going to uh, say that all individuals have equal rights, life, liberty, property, right, and so on. And uh, uh, we're going to do a lot of things democratically. Then what does that presuppose? Well, partly it, believe, it means that you believe that there is such a thing as universal human nature. And that's going to be one point of attack. Is there such a thing as universal human nature? Can we even articulate universal principles or not? And if we become skeptical about our capacity to think universally and in terms of very broad principles, then we're going to start thinking smaller scale and start focusing on smaller groups. And that's going to be one dynamic. But if you just think about democracy, why do we do democracy? And we say, oh, it's a very messy process. And we say, well, the ideal of democracy is going to be every adult is going to participate in the process. Every adult is going to have a say. And we want people to vote and we want them to vote in an informed way. But how are they going to become informed? Well, we expect them to do a lot of thinking, a lot of reasoning. That they can think about very complicated issues, foreign policy issues, environmental concerns, right, problems in, in the third world and so forth. Uh, that they can gather a lot of data. They are willing to listen to arguments by people who have different political positions. We can run experiments, and this is the science part coming out. We're going to give power to these people for a little while. We're going to assess the results. Is it working or not? If we say, I made a mistake four years ago in voting for this guy, I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to vote for these other people over here as well. That's a very optimistic, pro-reason mm -hmm. view of human beings. So an amazing thing that it has worked as long as it has. That's right. That's right. So democracy is in part uh, coming out of the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment had a very optimistic assessment of the power of human reason and that it was by and large universally distributed across all individuals and that with the right kind of education and the right kind of freedom, we can make people politically competent and you're going to get good results out of that process. Now, if you don't believe in reason... And all of the postmoderns stand at the end of a long skeptical tradition that came out of my discipline, philosophy, uh, that by the middle part of the 20th century said, reason really is impotent. Reason really is a fraud. Oh. And that is not what drives human beings. But uh, we'll, we'll come back to the how in just a question. But then the question is going to be, if you don't think that people are rational or that reason is particularly competent, then your understanding of how politics has to be done has to change. Mm -hmm. It has to be done non-rationally. Mm -hmm. If at the same time on the individualism, if you don't think people are able to understand uh, and, and respect universal principles of tolerance, universal principles of dignity, universal principles of rights, if you think that people are really narrow-minded, and that what they believe is really shaped by more local, more, uh, more selfish in the negative sense kinds of concerns, then you're going to say it's, it's, it's impossible that we can educate all human beings to believe in universal rights, that we're all brothers and sisters under the skin. That's just too pie in the sky. What's real is that people are parts of groups. That's where their tribal loyalties are. And once you start believing that, you're going to take politics in a very different direction. Now, the question about why so many philosophers and then people in, uh, who are philosophically trained in literary criticism, in law, in historiography, came to be skeptical, well, there's a long counter-enlightenment story that starts uh, also back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So there are important philosophers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Kant, in my uh, understanding of the, of the story, uh, and there's a long discussion that the philosophers are having and the way I read it and this is in, is, uh, in my book I'm glad that it's on the table so people can <laughs> see it thanks for that <laughs> is that uh, 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 things move slowly in the academic world but the skeptical arguments about the power of reason lost by the time we got to the middle part of the 20th century 
and then for a generation or so philosophers and philosophically educated people were kicking around and we didn't have a positive philosophical framework that grounded science, that grounded rationality, and that left a vacuum for various non-rationalist movements to gain some traction. Explain the last part of that, because I'm not sure I know what a non-rational... Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, if you think uh, about, uh, since we're we're talking about uh, uh, collectivism, socialism, Antifa, and so forth, these are all movements that come out of the left, right, broadly speaking. So by the middle part of the 20th century, that's when the big shift is going from the old left to the new left. Mm -hmm. So uh, people who are of our age now, we are old enough to remember when the new left really was new and it was vigorous. Mm -hmm. But what was the new left all about? Well, it was about a splintering of what had been a kind of monolithic, quasi-Marxist, neo-Marxist movement. Marxism really was the only game in town for the left for about a century. But when that came widely to be seen as a failure, including by people who were fellow travelers on the left, there was a lot of soul searching on the left and the left did splinter into a lot of new factions. And that's what the new left was all about. But a lot of it was anti-rational. So, For example, if you think of Maoism, uh, which became very popular in the 1960s, well, Maoism is a much more irrationalistic version of Marxism. And it's it's explicitly to say we're coming out of our Marxist traditions, but we think that Marxism was too wedded to rationality, to logic, to science. And what instead we need to do is not wait for rational, industrial, logical change in the march of history to occur. What we need to do is have strong assertiveness and will. And it's going to be these non-rational political energies that are going to, to, uh, to cause the right kind of revolutionary change. Uh, You have people in the Frankfurt School who are explicitly saying that what has happened is, so Herbert Marcuse is an important person in the 1960s, a thinker of the new left, that capitalism and science and technology have succeeded in taking over the world and normalizing things and giving us all of these goodies so that we're, you know, we're comfortable working our nine to five jobs and then watching the TV and doing whatever it tells us. And we're bought off by all of the gadgets and so on, that if you're going to retain any sort of humanity, you have to become an outcast. And you have to try the drugs, you have to try the crazy sex, you have to be willing to engage in the criminal activities. You have to go in the the fight club direction, thinking of the movie. Mm -hmm. That's the way that we have to break out of what is too rational, too logical a system. And in the, uh, the chaos, then we just hope some sort of new form of collectivism, socialism, or whatever our idealism is going to emerge. So it's an explicit embrace of non rational or irrationalist techniques, but that's given space by the failure of the intellectuals to say that no, we can understand the world rationally and logically and scientifically. Take me back to, I think it's Foucault that is over in Paris in 1968, and they look at postmodernism a little differently than it had been looked at, correct? Uh, who's they in this uh, kind of the French? Uh, yeah, the French philosophers, okay. yeah. Yeah, well, uh, again, postmodernism is a bit like saying uh, Christianity. So uh, immediately you do then have to say there's going to be Catholics, where... Potters, Eastern Orthodox. So, so there is a Foucauldian strain that is, I think, properly categorized as postmodern. So yes, Foucault and his followers do l- look at things differently than the American versions and some of the other strands that are prominent in the subsequent generations. Absolutely. Okay. So tell me, because I can't find a good reason, because it's all really about deconstruction, right? Uh, well, deconstruction is most associated with Derrida, and it comes out of literary criticism. It's a way of reading texts. Right. But, yes. But isn't, I mean, basically what? that says I can put that text, basically I can put my words into that author's mouth if I can draw the storyline together, yes, right? Well, uh, 
the idea then of deconstruction right, is to say when we are reading texts, there is no such thing as an objective reading of the text. The, the, the text amounts to evidence that so we can come up with hypotheses, consider various hypotheses and reject ones that don't fit with all of the evidence and come up with one that is the right or the best way to interpret a text. What they want to argue, and this takes us into some lots of technical issues in language and epistemology, semantics, and so forth, it says, we think that language is much too fluid, much too indeterminate, much too subjective, so there is no way to say there's a right reading of a text. Also, there's... Even if you have the, the author saying, this is the right... This is what I meant. Sure. And then, well, of course, then one of the things we can just say is, well, authors can lie. Right. <laughs> That's right. right. Uh, I mean, there's a famous painting. I think it's a painting of Trafalgar. No, it's not Trafalgar. I can't remember. It's a famous painting of the Americans defeating the British. Maybe it's, I can't remember. And there is a black man kind of hiding behind a white guy. Well, the black guy is Peter Salem who was a very important player in the American Revolution. The, the painter at the time is on record saying, that's Peter Salem. He's a hero in that battle. Mm. The, the way it's now, this art is being taught in, in uh, universities is, no, that's a slave. Mm. He was a free man. Uh, that's a slave. And it doesn't matter what the artist said at the time. Right. Now, here we should say something about Freud, though, because one of the things that uh, feeds into postmodernism via the Frankfurt School is the idea that surface pronouncements in our minds mm -hmm. are not necessarily the real agenda. Right. And they can also be invisible to the speaker. And so only the specially trained psychoanalyst right. or the specially trained critical theorist is the one who can know what's really going on. So I don't know this particular interpretation yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Peter Salem issue, but the argument is certainly going to be that there's a kind of false consciousness. Right. We know better right, than the right. artist does himself. If there was no Nietzsche and no Freud, would there have been uh, the... Uh, struggle of the 20th century the way it was? Ah, that's an interesting German what, what if question. Yes. Nasty, toxic brew yeah. of about 40 years with all kinds of stuff mingling and mixing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think Nietzsche and, and Freud are uh, justly read for the reason they were geniuses, they were br brilliant. I think we would have gotten there anyway. It just may have been different rather than saying that there's one towering genius like Nietzsche who put it all together effectively it may have been worked out by four or five individuals of mm -hmm. second tier statutes but is there is a logic to the way the intellectual discourse was going Nietzsche put the package together we would have gotten there I think anyways do, do I read it right you know God is not dead or I mean God is dead meaning good luck what are we going to do next? Because you're going to replace him with something. What are we going to do next? Kind of a, kind of a warning in a way. Um, it's not a celebratory God is dead, is it? Well, uh, I think it is. Do you? Yeah. No, if, now we're talking about Nietzsche interpretation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, His interpretation. Yeah, I think Nietzsche is ultimately seeing that as an affirmation. So his view is that God is dead, but he has, of course, a, a very negative view about religion that he right. thinks religion is a matter of uh, saying we are not going to take charge of our own lives, and so we are expecting right. a higher being to legislate for us, to keep us in line, right. and so forth. But and doesn't, so, isn't he also worried, though, about, okay, but people are people. You have to be careful on what you fill. We will fill that God thing in with something. Yes, so isn't he saying... Well, some of us will. He's saying most people, right, when they lose their faith, they become less religious, they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he believes that actually he's uh, kind of pessimistic about the broad range of human beings. They don't have mm -hmm. what it takes in order to actually put together a meaningful life for mm -hmm. themselves. So they're just going to wallow in some sort of mediocrity and, uh, and ultimately nihilism. So he does see the 19th century that he's living in as an era of, uh, this is a little bit anachronistic, kind of bad faith, where people don't really have 
the old style faith that mm-hmm. gave meaning to their lives, but they haven't really abandoned it. And so they, they kind of sort of go to church. They kind of mm-hmm. want to believe in religion or they go to socialism and say, you know, the state's going to look mm-hmm. after us. Um, so he does think since we've relied on religion for so many centuries, that it can't just be an instant, oh, mm-hmm. we don't believe anymore, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But he does think for people like him and other stronger spirits, as, uh, as he would call it, that this is a, a liberating movement, or, uh, uh, that realizing that there isn't a God who's got his eyes on you all the time and is mm-hmm. telling you what to do and you're just here to do God's will, that you're a free agent, uh, although freedom, we have to say mm-hmm. more about mm-hmm. freedom in Nietzsche, uh, that that is a kind of liberation. So then you are free to go and live your life on your own terms. But he does think that's only a realistic option for a small percentage mm. of, of the population. We go into World War One, and it's mm. a mess. And you, have, you get the Dadaists, in, and, and you have kind of this toxic stew. And then I think the... I mean, the Dadaists are making fun of the elites, really saying, I can do anything. Mm. Nothing has any meaning at all anymore. Is this part of postmodernism and the modern? Uh, how, uh, interesting. Yeah. You see what I'm saying at yes. all? Yeah. Is it, it has no, life has no meaning, and it kind of just kind of, kind of works its way into you know, all of the nastiness that comes in the next 10 years yeah. without a recognition, I think, of what they were actually trying to say. But maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Well, I think it's fair to say that the, you can see the seeds occurring culturally among then high culture before World War I. Uh, World War I certainly is extremely important. So Nietzsche is doing his writing in the 1880s, and he's becoming a thing Uh, before his death in 1900. So that whole end of the century transition, particularly in high culture, you can see a lot of Mm proto-Dadaist nihilism, despair, and Mm -hmm. so forth. And so just at a purely intellectual cultural level, if you are a well-educated person and you're a sensitive person the way an artist is, you're you're, Mm -hmm. you're channeling the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times, uh, and you have things like Darwin saying... And this Mm -hmm. is not Darwin, you know, nature red in tooth and claw, Mm -hmm. and we're all just animals and it's instinct, sex, and aggression. Mm -hmm. And you've got scientists developing theories like entropy, and it's going to be ultimately, you know, the heat death of the universe, and there is no God and happily Mm -hmm. ever after. If you are channeling all of that, uh, you're looking into the abyss, to use Nietzsche's language here. Well, uh, one reaction of that, of course, is just to become profoundly depressed, Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think another is uh, to go in a humor direction. Mm-hmm. To find is, 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 life is just ultimately just absurd and, again, anachronistically, to go in a kind of Monty Python, mm-hmm. play around with the absurdity mm-hmm. direction. So Dada, I think, is coming out of that. It is a, an, an embracing the absurd in a somewhat whimsical, but nonetheless at the same time serious way. Mm-hmm. So it's coming from a a deeply pessimistic place, but nonetheless, you've got some creative energy and you're not just going Mm -hmm. to go totally into nihilism. Mm -hmm. Now, then you add to all of those intellectual currents, World War I, and I think that must have been psychologically devastating. Is that? All of the allegedly civilized nations of the world just Mm -hmm. engaged in total brutality for four years. And the way I read it, the, the church is pretty much said, no, God's on our side, on mm-hmm. both sides. And it, it kind of was that final collapse of the lower class of the, the faith in, in God. And you, you had nothing, and they started turning to occultism, mm. uh, looking for any heritage, anything to hold on to, mm. right? Yeah. And the only reason well, why- World, World War I would be, a, a, if you're a troops, right? One of yeah. the millions of troops and, and you're not an educated person, you're just an ordinary working person or yeah. whatever. And you've got standard religion. Of course, the problem of evil or the, the theodicy yeah. problem is going to be real for you, right? God is on my side yeah. and I'm doing this to other men right. and they're doing this to me. And it doesn't yeah, make this sense. is not part of God's plan. It can't right. possibly be. And that, of course, 
how can there even be a God if this is the world that he's put us in? So yes, absolutely. So my line of questioning here is really, I think that there are patterns that repeat, and it's not exact, but they, they are the same general tune. We have the same kinds of things happening with us now to where society is collapsing. We've, we've had shocks to the system, not like World War I, but we don't really know what we're doing. The, the, the great American empire is, is seemingly coming undone. Mm. Um, nobody has an answer. There's nonsense from postmodernism. There's a hundred different uh, genders. And it's just all fraying mm. the way it did you know, 1920, Europe, mm. Germany. Mm. Am I reading too much into that? Well, uh, that's a big picture assessment. I think uh, things are actually better. I'm less, less pessimistic. We do have a lot of things to worry about, you know, absolutely. And, you know, crystal ball gazing, yeah. we, we can't go too far down that road. In one sense, I'm, I, I'm not worried because I do think in American culture, Canadian culture, broadly Western culture, which is now becoming global culture, we have yeah. huge cultural reserves that are very good. I think the vast majority of people are basically decent, basically rational, and so on. But we do have a problem with the, the fringe, edges. with the edges. Yeah. And I don't have good demographics on whether that's 3% or 7% or whatever. The latest study shows and, 8%, okay. about 8%, which okay. is really insignificant. Okay. Now, then that's a, it's insignificant in a quantitative demographic sense. But then the qualitative issue is where are those 8%? And if they are yes. in important cultural institutions like universities yeah. where all of the future professionals mm -hmm. and teachers and journalists mm -hmm. and so forth and politicians are going to be educated, then that 8% matters a whole a lot. lot more. Right? So there's got to be a qualitative measure as well. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you think about what people were struggling with in the first half of the century, you, know, you mentioned World War I, the Depression, World War II, the Holocaust. I don't think we are dealing with cultural and political enemies on that scale. We are dealing with postmoderns, yes, and they are mostly intellectuals. We're dealing with Islamists yeah. who are, you know, politicalized right. version of, of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, we are dealing with uh, political tensions in mm -hmm. Russia and China and mm -hmm. so on. But I don't think those are on the scale of World War I or World War II. I agree with so you. In so some let me... sense, our, our, our enemies are much smaller. So let me just say this. I am, uh, I, I, my, part of my job is to see a little bit over the horizon and to, to map it. Um, and, you know, as soon as the star field roll starts rolling the other way, great. <laughs> but as long as the star field is rolling that way, uh, okay, what do we do now mm -hmm. to prepare in case oh, those absolutely. things happen? Right. You have, global economic collapse, which is, you know, a, a somewhat of a, a, a pretty good chance that that could happen in the next five so years. So we have to identify all the possible apocalypses in yeah, so, sectors and, and, and have a reasonable plan. Sure. Yes, reasonable ones. What we have to do right now is start to come back together mm. because what happened in the 1920s, after all those things happened, then you had the Great Depression. Morals meant nothing in the 1920s. People started getting rich. They started, you know, fine. And I'm talking about Germany. Uh, um, they start get rich. The, the morals kind of go out the window, et cetera, et cetera. Then somebody comes and says, I'm going to reset it. Mm. And people were ready, at least 30%, ready to have that. And the rest just kind of went along. Uh, it was too late. We are having political enemies. We're starting to enter a time that could begin to resemble 1968 America, we have to learn how to have dialogue with the people we've been trained to hate. Mm. Yes. Or we're going to go down that road right. that has happened before. Yeah. So I, I want to talk to you about postmodernism in that framework here. Right. Because most people get up and they hear, oh, I have to... 
I have to now accept this gender, too, or I now have to say this, and yesterday that was okay, but today I could lose my job for saying that. They don't know where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. Nobody's recognizing it. Nobody is. You just comply. And so there's a large... The problem is the compliance element. I have no problem with us having a vigorous national discussion about how many genders and so forth there should be. That's absolutely right. The biology is complicated. The psychology is complicated, right? Absolutely. So we should exactly have that discussion. So we might then say the fact that there are some cultural sectors that are very loud, that are forcing this discussions on us, and it's all very bewildering, that actually is fine as yeah, long as not, we, as yes. long as we can discuss it, and that's the that's correct. The issue. The, issue, not, the, the problem is the politicization of the discussion. Right. The, yeah. I don't think anybody. Look, I, I don't know what the reality is, but I don't know anybody that looked at Bruce Jenner and did anything but. Oh my gosh, you felt that way your whole life? Why didn't mm, you say something? Sure. We don't want you to feel that way. Right. Yeah. Nobody was like, oh, well, you're a freak. I think we're beyond that for the most part. I think yeah. we're beyond. Well, that. Again, we got the three percent or whatever. Sure. Right. Um, so. I don't think we have that problem. The problem is, is that half of the country is being told you're stupid, you're racist, you're a bigot. And then that half now is starting to say to the other side, you're totalitarian. You are, uh, you just are going to gas us all. The vast majority on both sides, neither of those are true. Yeah. But we're not talking. So how do we do it? Right. Well, this is where I think postmodernism is dangerous because we all, I think as human beings, we have these frustrations that when we are arguing about various things, we don't necessarily like our views being challenged and we always have to you know, uh, go the extra effort to open ourselves up to that. We're good at challenging, not challenging ourselves. Right. Uh, well, and in many cases, we're not good at challenging constructively. So yeah. being able to, to, to learn how to do this. So all of these are emotional skills. All of these are cognitive skills. And I think it's part of the human condition that good thinking, good civil discourse takes a lot of work. And there are always temptations to engage in shortcuts. Even if we are people who have thought about various things and we know we're decent people, we've, we've, we've thought things through, we have various views. It's hard for us to want to open ourselves up to having to rethink things through again. Right? So at a certain point, it's easy for us to, uh, to, to close the door. So I think that's a part of human condition. Mm-hmm. But what good parenting does and what good education does is gives people the intellectual, the emotional, and the social resources to be able to do that throughout their lives. So the real danger is that what we now have is an elite in universities who are not teaching those skills. They have come to believe, this is the postmodern position, that rational discussion is not where it's at. Emotional tolerance uh, and a willingness to engage in civil discussion is not where it's at. And when the teachers of the teachers stop teaching those skills and start to model different things, then you're on a slippery slope. So, I mean, Steve, wait, wait, before you go any further, I mean, unless you think you need to complete that to complete the whole thought. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. I can come back to that. Right. I, I, again, I, I don't. How can a teacher, an honest teacher who thinks they're doing the right thing, say, no, I, you're just going to listen and take it and you're going to repeat it. Right. And if you step out of line, you, you know, and use some well, sort of rational thought, I don't. Well, you use the word honest and I think that there's that's the there, problem. Yes. Okay. okay. Now, I think there are two things, two things here. There are lots and lots. We always have these in any generation of teachers who are not honest about being teachers in the sense of liberal education that we're supposed to train people to think for themselves, give them all of the arguments, right, and so forth. There's always a temptation. Once you have a position of power, you become a teacher. You can mold young minds. You Mm -hmm. have your agenda, and you become an indoctrinator. So every generation always has that, even in the most gung-ho liberal Mm -hmm. education context that that is possible. So people, though, who know that they are doing that, they know that they are being dishonest, and they might mouth certain liberal education platitudes, but they know that in their heart of hearts, They really are just in the game for indoctrinators. And so part of what universities uh, should be doing is policing themselves against people who are just ideologues and not giving them tenure 
right, uh, and so on. So uh, we don't do that as well as we as we <laughs> used to, right? But then I think there is another subspecies here uh, that I don't think that they are dishonest, but they have convinced themselves that rational dialogue is 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 impossible. This is why I think the philosophy is most important. We have to have good epistemology that shows, in fact, we can identify facts, that there is something to scientific method, and that each of us, even if we're not professional scientists, should know something about evidence, argument, refutation, be able to follow a chain of thought. And as long as we don't have a significant number of philosophers, first-ranked philosophers teaching that, it's not going to trickle down into the other disciplines. What you will then have is a lot of people who are semi-educated, but the, what they will learn is, well, as with deconstruction, you can always make up a story, whatever story you want. Uh, uh, there's, you, know, you can lie with statistics, you can lie with words, and, and the distinction between truth and lie doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Once that becomes the widespread intellectual ethos, then people will say, well, I'm not being dishonest if I'm just making up my own narrative because it fits my value framework and using whatever social power I have as a teacher to get my students to believe that. I'm just doing what everybody else does, I think. That's where we are. That's where we are. So uh, you mentioned deconstruction earlier. There's a, an interesting right, point here. Uh, that's Jacques Derrida, who is most associated with that. But Stanley Fish, uh, who was a very famous professor at Duke for many years, and he came to my home state of Illinois. Interestingly, he was the highest paid public servant in the state of Illinois, making more mm. money than the governor for, wow. for a while. He was a superstar professor who was, uh, who was recruited. And uh, one of the quotations I, I like from him, I don't agree with it, but he's you know, de- deconstruction, basically saying, there is no truth, there is no objectivity, there's no such thing as a right interpretation of text. He said, this is very freeing. I don't have to worry about what the right interpretation of, of text is. All, great. I, all I need to do is just be interesting. Right. So I just be playful. And, uh, and, and then if I'm interested in some strange reinterpretation of a given painting or a given Shakespearean text, as long as it's someone reads that and says, oh, that's kind of fun or a new way of looking at it, uh, that's fine because no one can say I'm wrong. But uh, once there is no such thing as a right way to interpret things and we shouldn't be arguing about things, then what are professors supposed to be doing when they're doing with their students? If they're not training their minds, if they're not training them to look at both or all sides of an argument, you have power. And if you are a politicized person at all, you will use your power or indoctrination purposes. And so the connection I make here is uh, Frank Lentricchia, who was one of Stanley Fisher's colleagues at Duke, and he's speaking for a whole generation. Uh, this is a book published by University of Chicago Press, very prestigious press. You're saying, look, and I'm paraphrasing now, uh, the task of a professor is to train political activists. We live in a horrible, horrible regime where they basically capitalism, industrial revolution, everything is awful, sexism, racism, the whole shebang, that's taken as axiomatic from that perspective. Uh, but people are being indoctrinated by the major cultural organs mm-hmm. that are out there. My job as a professor is to the extent I have power over these students to get them angry about the system as it is. And we know what comes out of the anger is a sense that I need to go out and do something. And that will be the activism. So the lineage from Derrida, Rich to Fish, and Lentricchia is well worn out. Derrida in the 60s, right? Fish and Lentricchia writing in the 80s and 90s, and now we are one generation where those very bright individuals have influenced a whole generation, and now we have a more significant demographic who are exactly doing that. So how do we get it back? How do, how do we uh, how do we not embrace our anger and punch back? Mm. Well, I think uh, we should be angry okay, because I think this is a, a betrayal. Um, so I think the anger is there, but then we go back to the Greeks and anger management. Uh, the stakes are high, and anytime we have a, a major injustice and an anger assault, we should be worked up about it. I, I, but, I find it very difficult yes. to talk to people because when I say we cannot strike out, they think, they interpret that as you don't have a reason to be angry. Mm. This is righteous anger. This is 
I, my culture, I feel, my country, the, the enlightenment Absolutely. facts are, have been stolen. Yeah. And they, are, they have trained a new little army to mm. enforce it. Mm. So you're damn right. We're pissed. That's right. But now we have to be smart on how we fight exactly. it. Exactly. That's right. So your re- anger has to work with your reason. Your passions Correct. have to work right with your mind. So we ha- should be activists ourselves in the cause of truth and justice and the American way in the American context. Those values are legitimate values and they should be fought for vigorously. But right now the battle is not... World War One, World War Two. It's an right. intellectual battle, and right. so, and this is not just me as a professor saying, uh, you know, I'm a hammer and everything is a nail. This is the most important battle. It is an intellectual battle, and it has to be fought in the universities. Who's fighting it? Well, I am a little bit optimistic at this point because my sense is that. Most people who were first rate in the academic world in the 80s, 90s, and the first decades of the 2000s, they were off doing good work, whatever it was that they were doing. They are aware of postmodernism in various manifestations, and they're just saying, that's just a bunch of fringe people. I don't need to take them very seriously. Who can possibly take that seriously? And it doesn't make any sense to me anyway. Right. So uh, that then did leave a vacuum. And part of postmodern strategy or sub-strategies is to, the long march through the institutions to capture those institutions. So they were playing the political game. Correct. They are capturing those institutions. But then once they are in enough of a position to become a more serious nuisance, then I think the first-rate people start to pay attention. And so for the last 15 years or so, there has been an increasing number of people in all the major disciplines, right, in psychology, in history, in law, in my home field of philosophy, who are taking postmodernism seriously, and so the intellectual debate is being joined. And that's a good sign. Yes. And I think also a very good sign is that postmodernism is in part an activist strategy, and so now that it's done well in higher education, it's stepping out into all their cultural spheres, Mm -hmm. and so the more general public, who's also out there doing good work, Mm -hmm are starting to become aware of it, but we're also starting to see engagement on other cultural fronts as well. Now, I don't think there are any shortcuts. It's going to be unpleasant. It is going to be nasty. And I think as you are suggesting, in one sense, we, we have our, or at least one hand tied behind our back because we're not willing to initiate certain tactics that they are willing. Mm-hmm. We're going to take the high road, and I think we should take the high road. Well, doesn't Use it... physical force only as a last resort and in self-defense. Right, and it, it wouldn't, if it is about creating chaos yes. and dismantling by, by uh, and not using reason, by allowing yourself to be angry and reacting uh, in and creating more chaos, aren't you just hastening what they're trying to do? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's right. And you know, this, this may be a, a cheap shot, but I do think the, the postmoderns uh, and a lot of the activists, they, they recognize that if they have to come up with evidence, yeah, right. they're not going to win that game. Right. If it's a matter of logical, rational, scientific, they're not going to win that game. So they are using the tactics that they have, and that is, that is street fighting. Uh, just as in uh, other branches of the military, if you can't compete on traditional tactics or high-tech or whatever, you use guerrilla tactics. Uh, and so I think what we have is an intellectual guerrilla strategy that is being mounted here. And we do need to be willing to use force in self-defense and to keep that contained. There's a legitimate role for security forces mm-hmm. and police forces. Martin Luther King asked for Ask for a permit to carry a gun. Yeah, absolutely. He was denied, but sure. he, was, he asked for it. That's right. But uh, at the same time, we have to make sure that we are reacting only legitimately in, in a self-defense fashion. Yeah. And at the same time, paying more attention to the, the cultural institutions, the, the issues of civility, what really liberal arts education is about, what uh, proper rationality and respect for human dignity and human rights requires, and all the arguments and understandings that go into having a a, a decent rational philosophy that can support a a democratic republican polity, we need to reinvigorate that. 
to a large extent, the, the postmoderns uh, are operating in a cultural vacuum. We have taken a lot of things for granted and not defended them very well for several generations now, so we need to up our game. Would you come back and help us with that? And <laughs> I will be happy to. Help to teach some of the, the arguments that mm. I don't think people can... People haven't thought that deeply about yeah. things for a long time. Yeah, one of the sad things I'm noticing, I'm now old enough to have been on uh, several hiring committees, and uh, I'm at a smaller liberal arts institution, and so I interact with faculty is, uh, and I, I hope I don't just sound like an, like an old person at this yeah. point here, but an increasing number of people who come out with PhDs and they really have not gotten a full education. Oh. And it's not just that, you know, in the first generation or so, obviously we can't all read everything, mm -hmm. but uh, most of us have made an effort to read all, all of the greats and, and to know mm -hmm. something, to have some working. But an increasing, I noticed this about 15 years or so ago, people just say, no, I, I haven't read that and there's no need for me to read that. And it's one of the giants, right, in the, wow. in the literature. And sometimes it's just a matter of, well, I'm, I'm only interested in this. Uh, but also it's just, you know, that's from an alien tradition and... Uh, no point reading that. Um, the, uh, Stephen has written a book called Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism, and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. Uh, it is well worth your time reading, and I hope to have you back. All right. Thank Thanks you. for the plug, and thanks for the invitation. We want to thank Glenn Beck and Blaze TV for hosting Dr. Stephen Hicks. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. <laughs>